Welcome to Citygate Church Online. We're glad that you're joining us today. The message you're about to hear is recorded from our live Sunday services, and we hope that it encourages you today. Wonderful. So today I am thrilled to have Dr. Richard Perrin, Chief, with us. And um, been coming since 1999, and he's looking younger today than he ever did. Great to have you here. And... Um, you know, I'm believing God that today, as I've said, is a very significant day. So just like we received Pastor last week, Pastor Stenstrand last week and Ulrika, I'm going to ask us to stand to our feet today. Is that okay? And I'm going to ask you to stir your faith and give honor where honor is due as I in invite Dr. Richard Perrinchief up to the platform today. Come up, come on up, Dr. Richard. Great to see everybody. Come on, let's give a shout for Jesus right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, trying to give somebody a high five real quick, and you can be seated. We got to get right into it. We got to get right into it today. So many good things happening here at CityGate. We're just so thrilled to be with you for a historic Sunday to go to three services. It's a big, big deal, and we're very proud of you, very excited for you. And quite frankly, uh, Pastor Chad and I are on the verge of three services ourselves in the next uh, six months or a year. So we're here to learn from you. We're here to learn. I want to give honor to Pastor Julian, Pastor Sharon. They were with us in our church in October, and we had a great time, probably the best time we've ever had with them. And just, uh, they brought the house down, and we want to adopt them and steal them to Florida. So you better take good care of them, because <laughs> otherwise we're going to take them away. Anyway, um, my wife Gail sends greetings. We're about to have our 44th wedding anniversary next month. 44 years. So that's a great thing. Anyway, let's get right into the Word, shall we? I want to talk today about the battle for dynamic worship. I know you're a worshiping church. It's one of the strengths of this church, but I still have something in my spirit that I want to bring forth that I've never preached anywhere before, and it's something fresh for today. And Pastor Lindsay sends love, by the way. Pastor Lindsay is preaching the same message today in Ocala. We wrote this and worked on this together. Um, I'm starting with John chapter 4 from the Message Bible, just a few verses there, and weaving in Romans chapter 12 as well. John 4 verse 7 from the Message says, A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, Would you give me a drink of water? Jesus answered, uh, 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 down to verse 10, Jesus answered, If you know the gen knew the generosity of God, who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. And she said, Well, you're, what are you asking me for? He said, You'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh, living water. Everybody say, Living water. Down to verse 13, Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. He's talking to the natural water. He said, but anyone who drinks the water that I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. I just love that description. The woman said, sir, give me this water. Well, the conversation seemingly takes a turn when the woman tries to deflect Jesus' interest in the private life as he says, bring your husband. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, well, you've had five, and he's not, the one you're with isn't one. So she asked this deep theological question about the appropriate geographical location for worship. You know, people often deflect when you, when you get right to the point of something, and they're embarrassed or whatever. They just try to deflect. This is what she tries to do, but Jesus brings it back around, and he says, no, we're talking about, so you're asking me about worship and geography and history, he says, let me tell you, verse 23, the time is coming, and in fact it has come, when what you're called will not matter, and where you go geographically to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Here's the key. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father's out there looking for, those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit. Those who worship Him must do it out of their very being, out of their spirits, their true selves in adoration. We know that in other translations as to worship in spirit and in truth. 
want to weave just one other place. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 from the Amplified says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in, in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. Now, by the way, I just want to speak on behalf of donuts for a moment. I don't know what, I don't know what donuts ever did to Pastor Julian. He never eats them. But I would just like to say there are some things that are holy. Anyway. Sorry. Making a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your, re your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Present your whole being to him, which is your spiritual worship. Let's pray one more time. God, would you open the eyes of our heart today and grant the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Lord, we trust in you, and we ask you to come and move and change us all in Jesus' name. Uh, at home right now in, in Florida, we're talking about, our theme this month is called An Enemy Called Average, which is based on a book my friend John Mason wrote over 30 years ago, a dear friend of mine. And John's story, when I, when I had this, to, to, wanted to use this as a, as a theme, I called my friend John, who coined that phrase, and said, hey, can I use that? He said, yeah, I want to I do something. He said, but let me tell you the story behind it, how I got the title An Enemy Called Average in the late 1980s. I said, great. So his story was this. Um, he was reading the newspaper one day. Uh, do you still have newspapers here? I don't know. We don't... Yeah, 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 newspaper is like, a, it's like an old thing now. But anyway, he's reading the newspaper. This is way back in the last century. And uh, he's reading this article on the average American and statistics about what it is to be an average American. And he's, as he's reading, the average, he, he says the average pay for a man was such and such. And he thought, well, that's about what I make. And he's, they're describing the, the, the houses people live in. He said, well, that's about their size of our house. He and his wife, Linda, uh, had two children at the time. It says the average family in America has two children. He said, well, this is, and he started getting really upset. He said, now this is like saying that I'm just average. I don't see myself as average. Started to get angry with it. Then the kicker, the most common name for a man in that time was John. And the, most, the, the average, the most common name for a woman in America in the late 80s was Linda. And he thought, he, he threw down the newspaper. He said, this is crazy. I can't believe it. And he said a couple of days later, he was speaking at a Christian businessman's meeting in the morning. And he woke up and he said, he, the Lord spoke to his heart and said, the biggest enemy you're facing is average and averageness. That's what you're fighting and I submit to you that average is still a nemesis today all over the world. You know, the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments um, have to do with worship and interaction with God. Know the gods before me, don't worship idols, honor God's name and don't dishonor him, and remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. These are all things that we say in our church, life works best when God is first. The first four things are all about having priorities where God is actually first. You see, the problem is we, we, think, we think we worship God for his benefit, but he doesn't, have a, he doesn't have a need for worship. He doesn't have a need to be. We, God doesn't get up and have a bad day and city gate so I can feel like God again. So what happens is when you realize the principles of worship, idolatry is simply worshiping anything else other than God himself, and you love that more than you love God, and that slippery slope gets you to, the problem is when you worship something, you become like what you worship. Look at society today. The more we elevate, the more we, the more we pull God off of the first and the, and the top, the more we are given to all these other idols in the land, and the more we're becoming like them and, 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 and bound by these things. So when God's talking about worshiping him and no other God, it wasn't just for his benefit. It was to protect his own children from, from slipping away. 
Everything in the kingdom of God beckons you to live a life of significance in Christ, not just average. But everything in the world system since the fall of mankind pulls you down, holds you back, and questions your very existence, your purpose, and your relationship with God. In Exodus, there's an ongoing conversation when God sends Moses to speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. There's this ongoing conversation that begins through the ten plagues and ultimately the, del the deliverance of Israel. But that conversation I submit to you today is not just between Moses and Pharaoh or Egypt and Israel, the world and the church. It's also a conversation between heaven and hell, light and darkness. And here's the conversation. There is a very real spiritual battle over dynamic worship and sacrifice. Not just average worship, but dynamic worship where you're actually engaged, where, you're, where your heart and your mind and your body are, you, you know, you, it's possible to be jumping at church and have your heart thinking about pizza. Or have, have your heart thinking about the worries of life or the stuff you've been going through, stuff you carried in with you invisibly that no one else knows, and you're bringing them before God, but worship is to cast those things at the feet of Jesus and to engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth and find freedom in that and through that. And the problem is there's a battle for that. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 1 from the Living Bible, God said to Moses... Go to Pharaoh and tell him God's message. Release my people, listen, so they can worship me. Other translations say serve. But I want to bring it to you in the light of the battle is God says, Moses, go in there and tell him to release you to worship me. And Pharaoh gets furious with him. It begins this whole thing, and it, it, this ongoing theme emerges. Worship is about encountering the presence of God and experiencing him, not just going through the rituals and the motions. Anybody, listen, you look at um, the average church in the UK this morning, and I'd rather stay home and, and watch something on TV too. Why? Because God is worth more than average. God is, not, God is not looking for the average Christian. And when we get average is when we start comparing ourselves with other people instead of comparing ourselves with Jesus. We're to worship him and engage our spirit. So this conversation goes, and in, in the first part of the argument, Pharaoh says, okay, you can worship, but don't go too far. Don't go too far. Listen to this. Exodus 8, 25. He says, just stay here in Egypt and worship. Why do you have to leave? Isn't that interesting? The enemy of your soul usually tries to bargain with you to keep you from complete obedience to the Lord, just like in the garden. There's this bargaining process. Okay, you want to worship? Don't go too far. Don't go too far. Don't go wild. Sing your song, but don't go too far. Do your religious ritual, but live worldly. Go to church once in a while, but don't go too far. Hey, you want to read your Bible? Do it, but don't go too far. Don't believe it. Don't, you don't have to believe every word. Calm down and just compromise a little bit. And by all means, stay away from that Holy Spirit stuff. Settle for average worship. My friend, authentic worship doesn't make bargains with God or anybody else. I, I've, I know a lot of people, I've, I've heard people, and people in my own congregation have said to me, you know, uh, I, I've told God I will honor him and worship him if he does thus and so. That's not worship. That's not worship. That's a, that's, you're, you're trying to manipulate heaven into doing your will instead of you saying, not my will but yours be done. Authentic worship doesn't make bargains with God or anybody else. Moses replied to Pharaoh when he says, don't go too far. Moses says, we will go out three days journey. Three is always the number of resurrection and transformation. We will go out as far as God wants us to go. We're going to go out there. So Pharaoh, the Bible says, continues to harden his heart, and he refused. You can't go. So plagues hit. The thought is this. 
because they were slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh starts to describe the fact that he thinks that worship is an excuse to be lazy. And they double down the workload and they make the work harder. Can I tell you that's not true? In fact, the word worship there, the word serve or worship in Exodus, in the original text, in the original Hebrew, not just the word is avad, it means worship, but it also can be translated work or service. When you go to work, you can worship. I'm not saying go and sing in your song. I'm not saying go and beat a, beating people on the head with your Bible. I'm saying your work is part of your worship. Your job is part of your ministry. Your, what you do Monday through Friday is a calling, just like Pastor Julian's calling to be the pastor here. You have a calling, but you have to utilize and you have to see it that way. You have to see your life and your work as a worship of God. So more plagues, get, more plagues hit. Pharaoh says, okay. Now listen to the next bargain. Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let you go worship your God, but only the men. Leave your women and children here. This patriarchal, this whole old-fashioned idea of men only, and that's exactly what the devil does. Okay, take, you can take the men, but he knows, he knows if he's got the women and children hostage that the men are coming back anyway. And many times in the modern generation, we are willing to leave our spouses. We're leave, listen, in this day, there's a subtle temptation to get your worship on, but not to impart your experience to the next generation or even into your marriage and your spouse. Psalm 71, verse 18, one of my life verses, this is a new translation called the Passion Translation. It's a paraphrase. <clears throat> David says this, God, now that I'm old and gray or old and color my hair, as the case may be. Don't walk away. Three people got that joke, anyway. <laughs> God, now that I'm old and gray, don't walk away. Give me grace to demonstrate to the next generation all your mighty miracles and, and your excitement to show them your magnificent power. Man, I'm living for that now. I'm living that. My oldest grandson is about to turn 15 in a few weeks. And I'm just thinking like, the time is moving so quick. They say, the, they say the, the days are long, but the years are short. It goes by very quickly. The older you get, the faster it goes. You turn around. I mean, this is the 25th anniversary of me coming to City Gate Church this year. 25 years this year. What an honor it is to be in the journey together and to have Pastor Julian come so often and be with us with Pastor Sharon in Florida too. It, we're, we're walking together through this thing. But part of, I love Psalm 145 verse four. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. My friends, if we don't include our families in our worship, we lose. We win the battle for ourselves, but we lose the war for the generations and the future. So, so he makes this bargain, and Moses says, no, we will take our wives and our children with us. Listen to this. So the more plagues hit, darkness for three days, and another offer comes. Pharaoh says, okay, we, we just remove this darkness. We need your help. Here's the deal. You can take your women and children, but leave your wealth. Leave your cows and your sheep in Egypt. Leave your stuff behind. You know what God said? When you go out, you're going to take the Egyptians' wealth with you. Not only are you going to take yours, you're going to take theirs. But the enemy is bargaining right there. Leave your cows and sheep in Egypt. Leave your wealth here. Listen to this from God's Word translation. Exodus 20, 24. And Pharaoh called for Moses and said, Go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you, but your flocks and herds must stay behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to take our animals for the sacrifices and burnt offerings we have to make to the Lord our God. Moses knew something instinctively. He said, You can't genuinely worship without making a sacrifice. Worship is not worship if you're just divided, a house divided against yourself and going through the religious rituals. You can, you can bend and genuflect and cross yourself and, and, and jump on a pole and, and, and wear crosses around your neck and it doesn't mean a thing. Because worship is about engagement. 
It's about connection with the living God. And Moses knew that it has to pinch a little bit. It has to cost you something you hold as valuable. We offer unto the Lord, Hebrews says, a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. It's a sacrifice when you don't feel like it. It's a sacrifice when you're tired. It's a sacrifice when you're going through a season where things don't seem to be going well. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. You can't genuinely worship without making sacrifice. We say around our church, there's no glory of God, which is the goal. There's no glory without worship. There's no worship without sacrifice. There's no sacrifice unless it costs you something. Let God's people go. Don't compromise your freedom of worship. I'm almost done. David refused average worship many times. He had those same temptations, the same bargain that went on between Pharaoh and Moses happened many times in the life of David. Now remember, David was mocked for being a psalmist. He was a worshiper. That was part of his DNA. He he didn't just sing songs and play the harp. He was a worshiper, and his own father misunderstood him. He was the creative kid. He 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 didn't look like a warrior, but he was a warrior because he was a worshiper. And he was mocked by both King Saul and Goliath himself for pursuing his job, his mission, to take down the giant, even as a young person, even as a teenager. This psalmist warrior, and he was mocked again by his first wife, Michael, Michelle, whatever you want to call her. Uh, She wasn't Michelle Mabel, I'll tell you that. But anyway... (laughs) He, when he's bringing the ark home, he's leaping and jumping and dancing. The Bible says he was spinning around and he's moving and he's dancing. And she looked out the window and said, my father would never have acted like that. That's not very kingly. That's not very regal. It's not very royal. He's making a fool of himself. And she mocked him. And the Bible says that when he got home, she mocked him to his face and dishonored him. And he said, you don't understand what the presence of God means to me, dear. He said, wait, because I will be twice as vile tomorrow. Uh, From my American mindset and my generation, we say, you ain't seen nothing yet, baby. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just starting to warm up because my God is worthy of jumping and shouting and praising and expressing everything I can. I want my whole being to express my passion for him. Even when David messed up with a prideful census, he prepared to offer a sacrifice to the Lord by making atonement. When the Mount Moriah landowner, a guy named Ornan, proposed to provide the land and all the animals for the sacrifice for free. And David said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is, this is about worship. This is about engagement with the, with the living God. This is about a relationship with him. I will, uh, he said, I cannot do it this way. First, First Chronicles 21, 24. David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. My friends, worship is about, it's about a sacrifice. It's about a pinch. It's about, it's about presenting yourself unto God. There's no bargain prices for dynamic worship. As Jesus was exalted on Palm Sunday and rode in the triumphal entry, they were singing Hosanna. It was the greatest moment of Jesus' earthly ministry in real and true worship. The people were understanding who he was and started casting these palm branches and waving them and honoring him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hosanna to the Son of David. And he rides in and we see this other aspect of Jesus' personality. He wasn't just walking around. And, you know, I, I, I always laugh sometimes when I see the 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 renderings, the, the paintings of what Jesus supposedly looked like, and they always make him look so sad. They always make him look <laughs> forlorn, sad. But the, the thing about Jesus is little kids, you can't fool little kids. They ran to him and jumped into his arms. If he looked like he was baptized in pickle juice, they would never do that. <laughs> They, you can't fool children. They know if you're, if you're a sad person and they don't want to be around you. 
But they wanted to be around Jesus. And in this moment, Jesus is so moved, he gets up, and the Bible says he runs into the temple and starts clearing out the money changers. Remember that? And, he, and the, the money changers was not like, like selling products at church. He was, he was turning over the tables of those who were selling animals for sacrifice for people who came unprepared looking for a discount on their sacrifices. If you read the scriptures and read and put in the context of Malachi, the, the people started bringing defective sheep and lame goats and blind doves and all these defective animals, and they would cut, they were, there was a cut rate for worship. Hey, get your defective sacrifice here. We can for a bargain price of only two things or two two pence or whatever. You can get all these defective things and bring them to before the Lord. That's what aggravated Jesus. He got up. This was not about selling something at church. This was about this was about people who didn't see their worship as a true sacrifice and putting God first. They they were doing the religious deal, but their heart was far from God. He turns over the tables and said, "My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, for all the people groups." And he prophesies what the church will become. You can't bring damaged goods except for yourself. Present your body a living sacrifice. You can't bring something defective and try to pretend it was perfect. You've got to bring yourself, your full self. Finally this. In the days of Elijah, when he challenged the prophets of Baal and Jezebel to a contest to reveal the real God, to reveal whose God is real, he said to them first, you guys go first, worship. And they started first thing in the morning, and the prophets of Baal started worshiping their God, looking for fire to fall as a sacrifice, and there was nothing that happened. And Elijah, it's a really funny story, actually, because Elijah starts mocking and says, oh, is he busy? Is he on vacation? Maybe he's in the toilet. Maybe, he's, maybe your God is just busy right now. He let them go all day long. And sometimes I think it's because of the dramatic nature of God in a way that um, he lets it go till darkness falls. Fire's going to be a lot more impressive when the darkness falls. And as soon as it gets dark, he says, okay, my turn. And he did two things. The Bible says he took 12 stones and he rebuilt the altar. He built a new altar. I believe what God is saying to our generation is you better have some alterations. It's time to reprioritize and build a new altar in order. God, listen, we, we see there's a, a bumper sticker in America uh, that used to be common says, bless this mess. Can I tell you, God can't just bless your mess. He wants your, he wants your heart to be in order. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to be building an altar, a place where you can worship him in spirit and in truth, where you can engage him. And then Elijah does something else that's kind of curious. And I've heard people preach it all different ways, but he has them pour huge amounts of water upon the bull and the altar and then said, Lord, let your fire fall, consume and receive the sacrifice. And as soon as that happened, the fire fell and the Bible says clearly, it licked up all the water around the altar and consumed the bull. Why? Because the greatest commodity in a time of three and a half years of drought is not the bull itself, it's water. The biggest offering is not the bull. And it's not, so, you know, some of you are offering God a lot of bull. It's time to worship him in spirit and in truth. My friends, the biggest offering is the hardest thing to give. Don't settle for average worship. Because worship is about engagement Connection with God, reverential awe and wonder, not just singing a song at church. It's about, wow, God, I know myself and how imperfect and how impure I feel sometimes. 
but your love never gives up on me. It's to be wowed by God, to be in awe of Him. I just want to pray for you real quick. Would you bow your head and close your eyes right now? Holy Spirit, you're the Spirit of grace and the Spirit of worship. Would you let your fire fall today and consume these living sacrifices? We can live for you. That we can engage with you. Plug in with you. Give and receive from you. In Jesus' name. Just keep your head bowed just for a moment. I'm going to ask you a question. How's your God connection? How's your God connection? Is this something, maybe it's maybe something new. You know, new people get fired up for God, but can very quickly fall into just church culture or in a, another type of church in just religious culture and just kind of settle in for average. The enemy would love to bargain with you. Sure, just go to church. But just be a nice Christian. Just be, just be nice. Just be nice. No, no, no. It's about engagement, connection. In just a moment, Pastor Julian's going to come up. And he's going to lead you. Because today, I believe God is connecting with some of you in a brand new way. Many of you have been walking with the Lord for a long time, but if you were real honest about it, you've been settled for, settling for average for a long time and playing the game. It's time to set it aside and give him your whole heart. David said, I have to pay the full price. I cannot give God what costs me nothing and call it worship because it's not. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord of your life, maybe somebody brought you to church today and you're trying to figure this out, we want to pray for you. Maybe, just maybe, there are some of you that need to really rededicate yourself right now and quit playing the, 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 the compromise game. Quit bargaining with your own mind and give him your heart. I want to pray for you real quickly. If that's you, you want to give Jesus your life for the first time, would you just lift your hand up in the air real quickly right now? I want to pray for you right now. Is there anybody that doesn't know the Lord? That's a big step. Secondly, maybe you're here today. And you know the Lord, but you also know you have been bargaining with darkness and you didn't realize it. You've been playing games of, I, I'll, I can just do this and get by. But today you have a revelation that came. I want to pray for you as well. Would you put your hand up? Say, Pastor, I, need, I want to rededicate my life to God. I want to really connect with Him in a real way. God bless you. God bless you in the back of the... God bless you, ma'am. God bless you in the very back there. God bless you. So glad you put your response right there because by faith, you got to trust in him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for each person whose hand was raised, everyone whose heart is open, that this would be a moment of real surrender, that they would know that you're not a God of religion, but a God of love and relationship, that you want to engage and converse and build fellowship with each and every one of us. Lord, forgive us for our sins, change us, and glorify your name through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Joe. Well, thanks for joining us today. We hope this message has encouraged you and built your faith. Remember to subscribe and join us live every Sunday where we're live for our Sunday services. We'll see you next time.